A Warhammer Novel Witch Killer Matthias Fullman, Volume 3 Written by C.L. Werner This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death, and of the world's ending. Amidst all the fire, flame and fury, it is a time too of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the empire, the largest and most powerful of the human realms. Known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers, it is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests and vast cities. And from the throne in Aldorf reigns the emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the knightly palaces of Bretonia to icebound Kislev in the far north, come the rumblings of war. In the towering world's edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of rat things, the skaven, emerging from sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wildernesses, there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever near, the Empire needs heroes like never before. Prologue The man's breath came short and sharp, his pulse quickening as he heard the scratching of verminous claws upon naked earth. There is no shame in fear, he thought, only in how you confront it. He reached into the shirt, his hand closing upon an icon set upon a silver chain. He smiled as he felt a hammer shape press upon his palm. Whatever haunted the darkness, he did not face it alone. Alone, once again, Matthias Fullman cursed himself for being a fool. Nearly a hundred men had entered the gloom beneath the Schloss von Gotz, invading the black underworld below Wurtbad. Soldiers from the Ministry of Justice, veteran witch hunters from the Wurtbad chapter house, elite men from the palace guard of Baroness von Gotz, even half a dozen Templar knights of Moor, the forbidding Black Guard, had placed themselves under Fullman's command, following his lead into a grotesque labyrinth of nightmare and horror. Nearly one hundred men, the most disciplined fighters Wurtbad could offer. Fullman uttered a hollow laugh. A thousand would have been too few to explore the insane network of tunnels underneath the city. Passageways snaked and writhed through the dripping, stagnant earth without pattern or scheme. After half an hour of traversing the madhouse corridors, Fullman had been unable to decide if he was a few feet beneath the surface or a few hundred feet. Their foe had struck, erupting from numberless openings in the walls, the floor and the ceiling of the tunnel. A living tide of snapping fangs and slashing claws, the ratmen had set upon them in feral savagery. Only with blood and steel had the vermin been pushed back, squealing into the darkness, leaving their own dead littering the floor. The victorious men had given pursuit, hounding the fleeing monsters into their burrows. It was then that the tunnel began to shake and quiver. Fullman recognized the sound and the sensation all too well. Looking over at the hulking armored form of Captain Justicar Erhard, he saw that the Grim Templar recognized it too. Both men shouted a frantic warning, and the entire company took to heels, fleeing the passageway as the Skaven collapsed it in upon them. Thulman shook his head at his own audacity. His newly lit torch had revealed something else to him. He was alone. None of the soldiers had reached the safety of the side tunnel he had sheltered in. Lost and alone, with only the feeble light of the torch to guide him, he had enough to worry about without wishing for a confrontation with a Skaven sorcerer, the one who had drawn him into the tunnel to begin with. The scratching of claws on bare earth came more distinctly, with a suggestion of whispered hisses. Fullman pulled his sword from its sheath. They'd found him at last, the scuttling horrors of this black underworld. With their inhumanly sharp senses, he had known it was only a matter of time before the Skaven tracked him down. The possibility of running passed through the witch-hunter's mind, 
quickly subdued and killed by his iron resolve. If he were fated to die in the Skaven Warren, he would do so with honor, with his wounds to the front. Chittering laughter crawled in the darkness. A loathsome shape crept forward, its scrawny body covered in lice-ridden fur. The face that snarled at him from beneath a rusty steel helmet was that of a monstrous rodent, chiseled fangs jutting from the lips of the muzzle. In an extremity that was more paw than hand, the ratman held a crooked sword crusted with decay. A long scaly tail lashed the floor behind the creature as it squinted at him with hungry red eyes. Fullman felt disgust fill him as he watched the skaven creep forward. He prepared himself for the monster's attack, knowing all too well with what frenzy the ratkin could fight. The shrill, inhuman laughter was repeated. More of the underfolk emerged, their fanged faces slavering at the lone human they had cornered. Fullman's hope of survival withered before him, as more and more rodents came out of the darkness. They stood there for a moment, squinting against the light of Fullman's torch, squealing and hissing to each other in hungry anticipation. The witch hunter knew it was only a matter of time before the Skaven overcame their trepidation and pounced upon their prey. Fullman firmed his grip upon the blade. Whichever monster was the first to dare his steel, that one at least would accompany him into the kingdom of Moor. A furry body slammed into Fullman from behind, clawed feet digging into his legs as they scrambled for purchase, a wiry arm wrapping around his throat while sharp fangs snapped beside his ear. Only the witch hunter's heavy cloak prevented the would-be killer from ending his life turning the murderous knife gripped into its paw so that it merely slashed along his flesh. Fullman cried out in pain and outrage. Even as the skaven clinging to his back pulled his knife back to make another attempt, the witch hunter's arm was swinging upward, thrusting the burning torch into the rat man's face. The skaven dropped away from him, its shrill screaming deafening as it writhed across the floor. There was no time to savor the cringing killer's agony. As soon as the ambusher had attacked, the other skaven were in motion, lunging forward like a pack of starving mongrels. Thulman's sword licked out into the darkness, bisecting the snout of one attacker as it scurried towards him, gashing the shoulder of a second. And then they were on him, a burly blackford monster crushing him to the ground as its powerful arms closed around his midsection. A clawed hand ripped his sword from his fingers as he struck the ground while third feet kicked dirt upon his dropped torch, causing the light to flicker and dim. Ravenous eyes glared down at him, ropes of drool dripping from fanged muzzles. Matthias Fullman had always expected that his service to the Order of Sigmar would end in a hideous death, but being eaten alive by the Skaven was a more ghastly end than his worst nightmares. Suddenly, the shrill scream of a skaven rattled in the passageway. The monsters turned around in fright, noses twitching. Fullman saw the body of a ratman fly through the air, filthy blood streaming from an enormous gash in its chest, a hulking shape behind it. The witch hunter laughed aloud as he renewed his struggle against the ratman holding him down. The monsters had been so intent upon tormenting their prey that they didn't notice their new adversary. It was not a battle, but a massacre, and one the Skaven quickly decided they wanted no part in. Fullman could hear the meaty impact of his savior's massive sword as it cleaved apart the bodies of the ratmen. The feral courage of the Skaven quickly crumbled, squeals of fright and the acrid reek of fear replacing their hungry snarls and mocking laughter. The monsters holding the witch hunter broke and ran, leaving only the Blackford warrior straddling his midsection. The Ratman snapped its fangs in fury at his comrades and transfixed Fullman with his malicious gaze. Before the monster could bring its crooked sword stabbing down, an immense length of steel flashed through the darkness, sweeping through the Ratman's body and bisecting the creature at the waist. The spurting wreckage of the Skaven's lower half crumpled to the floor. Fullman painfully lifted himself to his feet, accepting the gauntleted hand that reached down to him. The witch hunter wiped the reeking filth of the slain ratman from his clothes. Gazing around him, he recovered his sword and hat. His rescuer leaned upon the mighty Zweihander, the point of the giant sword stabbed into the bloody floor. Covered from head to toe in black plate armor, 
the warrior didn't even seem slightly fatigued by the brutal battle he had fought. The only concession to comfort he made was to lift the rounded cylinder of his helmet from his head, exposing his hard features and bold pate. Captain Justicar Erhart of the Black Guard of Moor, watchful man while the witch hunter recovered his gear. It seems I am not the only one who escaped the trap these fry-stamped rats set for us, Fulman observed, as he restored the wide-brimmed hat to his head. Indeed, Brother Matthias, the knight growled. These creatures seem determined to increase the retribution I owe them. Looking at the carnage Erhard's sword had visited upon the underfolk, Fulman almost felt pity for the vile creatures. I have seen some sign that the others made it clear, Erhard continued. You are the first I have actually found, however. It is well that you came when you did, Fulman said. The black guardsman shrugged off the witch hunter's gratitude. Fulman could understand the sentiment. Her heart did what he did out of duty, not for recognition. The witch hunter took stock of his injuries. Most were little more than scrapes and bruises. Only the dampness along his back worried him. He winced as his fingers probed where the skaven's dagger had cut him. The wound was shallow despite its painfulness, and seemed to have stopped bleeding. Infection was a more pressing concern than bleeding to death, but there was little he could do about that at the moment. You are injured? Erhart inquired. Fulman nodded his head as he set a linen handkerchief against the dripping wound. If it was infected, it would be every bit as lethal as the mutilating strokes of Erhart's Zweihander. Nothing that would prevent me from doing Sigmar's work, Fulman said. He studied the black openings and peppered the passageway before them. Shall we see if we can find more survivors? And if we do? The knight asked, as he fell into step beside Fulman. We pursue our original purpose, the witch hunter replied, after a pause. We track down this Skaven sorcerer and visit the justice of Sigmar upon it. Chapter 1 The chapter house of the Order of Sigmar in Wurtbad stood on a winding street some small distance from Wurtbad's temple district. The building was a squat two-story affair, its gabled roofs pointing towards the north, a plaster icon of the twin-tailed comet fixed above the entrance. The chapter house was not immune from the caprices of change which had settled upon Wurtbad. One of the dungeons beneath the structure had partially collapsed, after being penetrated by the inhuman Skaven, who damaged the foundations too. More far-reaching, however, would be the death of the chapter house's master, Witch Hunter Captain Meiser, a final casualty in the fierce fighting that had raged in the Schloss von Gotz. It would be months before Meiser's successor was appointed and installed in Wurtbad. A more immediate change, however, was what interested a man who had devoted himself to watching the chapter house since dawn. From the window of the house of a petty Sigmarite official, he had watched the comings and goings associated with the brooding structure across the cobbled street with keen interest, too. With a quill, he carefully made a note of every person arriving and leaving. As darkness settled, he at last turned his eyes from the chapter house door, consulting the notes he had scratched into a sheet of vellum. A smile twisted his features. By his calculations, there should be only two or three men left in the chapter house, one of them wounded. He considered the rather numerous household of the owner of the home, patiently waiting for him in the parlor below. Eight against two and a half were the kind of odds he was willing to entertain, especially since his eight would be a bit more durable than the denizens of the chapter house. Yes, he decided, the risk was slight, but the potential reward promising. Eldred hurried through the lonely halls of the chapter house. He had been long in the service of the witch hunters, and knew well the priceless value of speed. With such dark powers at work in Wurtbad, even the slightest delay meant damnation and death. Certainly the relentless, steady pounding upon the oak doors of the chapter house bespoke urgency. The pounding on the door continued unabated as Eldred rushed towards it. Had something gone wrong? Did the witch hunters need help? 
And if they did, what kind of aid could Eldred possibly offer? With a sense of grim foreboding, he placed his hand on the thick steel bolt which held the door shut, and peered through the narrow grate set into the portal. The man that stood outside the chapter house was not one of the Templars, although he was not unknown to Eldred. Constantine Trauer was a clerk for the Temple of Sigmar, maintaining the many accounting ledgers that monitored the temple treasury. He was a small, nondescript man, with an almost effete demeanor. In the light brown cloak of his office, his thinning hair plastered against his one side of the forehead, there was certainly nothing about the man that suggested menace. Yet Eldred found himself instantly recoiling. The clerk seemed oblivious to the alarm, barely registering the fact that a door had swung open, his right hand half raised as if to strike upon it once again. Eldred's fingers tightened about a slim dagger he wore at his belt. Ever since the attack in the dungeon, Fullman had ordered all the servants to go about armed. Eldred was thankful for this edict as he watched Constantine stagger forwards, his steps clumsy and awkward. The clerk's head swayed brokenly upon his neck, and Eldred gasped as the blind, lifeless chill of Constantine's eyes met his gaze. The servant rushed forwards, dagger clenched in his fist, determined to slam the door shut before the clerk could stagger into the room. Eldred barked a command for the clerk to withdraw, and threatened him with a dagger, but Constantine continued to shuffle forwards. His bleary eyes didn't even react to the sound of the servant's voice. The eerie lack of response from the clerk sent a shiver of fear wriggling down Eldred's spine, but what he saw moving beyond the clerk caused him to gasp. More figures were stepping out from the darkness, moving with shuffling, swaying steps. Whatever was wrong with Constantine, he was not alone in the affliction. Too late, Eldred realized that he had allowed the intruder to stand between himself and the warning bell set beside the door. The old servant cried out, screaming an alarm to the other occupants of the chapter house. There were two other servants in the building and Franz Grief a witch-hunter who had been injured in the battle with Baron von Gotz. He only prayed that his warning came in time. Eldred flung himself at Constantine. For all the ungainliness, the clerk was immovable, and held his ground against the charge. Eldred's fingers stabbed his dagger into the thing's shoulder. For the first time, the zombie seemed to take notice of him, lifting the cadaverous fist and smashing it into Eldred's skull, spilling the servant to the floor. Head swimming, Eldred struggled to rise to his feet and face the monster once more. I need one of you alive, a sneering voice hissed from the doorway. Eldred turned towards the sound, seeing a man who was almost as corpse-like as the undead followers. He wore a grey cassock around his lean body, trimmed in thick brown fur. The exposed skin of his hands and face was pallid and sickly, his black hair stringy and unkempt but there was a malevolent life in those eyes that stared from the man's thin, hungry face, exuding an almost tangible sensation of the profane and the evil. Here, then, stood the master of the corpse puppets. The necromancer waved his leprous hand, and the zombie of Constantine shuffled back towards Eldred. If you behave, you can be my prisoner, the sorcerer said as he strode into the building. With arcane gestures, the necromancer ordered the zombies into the chapter house, and watched as they marched silently into the building. It wasn't long before the screams banished the eerie silence. The necromancer's pale features pulled back in an appreciative smile as the sound reached his ears. Eldred groaned in horror as he heard his comrades murdered. The sorcerer glared down at the captive. Do the sounds of death disturb you? The necromancer laughed. This is but the prelude of the symphony. He crouched down to stare into Eldred's eyes. If there was one thing I learned from the tedious operas of my homeland, it is that every instrument has a part to play. Impossibly, the smile on the sorcerer's face became even more menacing. Now it is time to put yours into play. I will ask you a question, and you will provide an answer. Where did they put the vampires? Eldred moaned in renewed horror as he heard the necromancer's words. 
but a fresh string of screams from deeper within the chapter house killed any thought of refusal. The sorcerer rose to his feet again, motioning for the zombie of Constantine to lift their captive from the floor. With an extravagant flourish, the necromancer motioned for Eldred to lead the way. The servant complied with shocked subservience, moving almost as lifelessly as the zombies themselves. You may have thought yourself finished with me, Sibekai, the necromancer thought as he followed behind Eldred, but Carandini has not yet finished with you. Lie down and die already. Strang's boot smashed into the ratman's face, spattering the earthen wall with blood and fangs. The mercenary delivered another brutal kick to the creature's throat, crushing its windpipe. The body continued to shudder and twitch, but the brute was good and dead. Strang wiped a hand caked in dirt and blood across his forehead to stem the trickle of sweat seeping into his eyes. He cleaned his gory blade on the ratman's body, not allowing himself to think about how it had nearly been him lying on the floor of the cavern. Even a moment's distraction meant the difference between life and death in the creeping dark of the Skaven Warren. The mercenary turned away from the dead monster, eyes narrowed as he looked for any other sign of opposition. The floor of the cavern was strewn with furry carcasses. Some were old, others were much more recent. Strang saw human bodies mixed in with those of the vermin. Some of those too had been present before the ambush. Only one of them wore the livery of the Von Gott's palace guard, and there didn't seem to be any other soldiers or witch hunters among the dead. Strang breathed easier, but did not relax his guard. I don't think they planned that ambush, a scar-faced soldier in the Griffin Tabard of the Ministry of Justice said. I think they were trying to hide in here and we surprised them. Strang spat on the corpse closest to him. They damn well surprised us with that cave-in of theirs. The warrior could see the expressions of the men around him darken as he mentioned their recent escape. Only a dozen of them had gained the safety of the side tunnel before the entire passage collapsed. Since then, two emotions had struggled to control every man. Terror and rage. Strang had been careful to cultivate the fury every man felt, bringing it to the fore. Fear would do nothing to help their chances of survival, but savage hatred might. Rather peculiar hole, even for the underfolk, one of the palace guards commented, tapping the side of what looked to be a large iron stove with the flat of his sword. Strang looked at a strange object scattered about the cavern. Tables strewn with stoppered jars and foul-smelling bottles, a brick kiln, several iron furnaces, and some kind of immense press. The hair on the back of his neck began to rise. Ever since taking service with Fulman, he had seen the laboratories of more than a few alchemists, and this apparatus looked disturbingly familiar. A thought flared in his mind as he strode towards one of the human corpses. Turning it over with his foot, he found himself looking into a villainous face, frozen in an expression of horror. But more interesting was the leather mask he found in the pocket of the man's tunic. A leather mask with a long, bird-like beak and crystal lenses over the eyes. The mask of a plague doctor. The inarticulate howl of frustration that exploded from Strang turned every eye on him. The soldiers watched, puzzled, as the mercenary hurled the leather mask across the cavern with a savage gesture. He'd been here. That foul scum Fulman had hunted across half the empire. The bastard physician who experimented upon his fellow man, filling the veins of his victims with the filth of chaos. Freiherr Weiss had been here. This was his lab, the fountainhead of Sturblight and the plague of Wurtbad. Strang snarled, sweeping his arm across one of the tables, knocking jars and bottles to the floor, and then gripped the edge of the table and upended it, sending it crashing to the floor. He turned away from the vandalism to find the soldiers watching him warily. Come on, he barked. There's nothing here. Let's get moving. Where? protested one of the palace guards. Where are we supposed to go? Where? Strang's eyes were like ice as he turned on the man. We'll take one of these tunnels and find our way back to the surface. 
The mercenary stabbed a finger at one of the black tunnel mouths, a decisive gesture that gave no hint of the randomness with which he chose it. We kill any rat bastard unlucky enough to come across our path, he added with a venomous oath. The threat of plague had kept the waterfront of Urtbad abandoned. Even the most desperate of the city's denizens forsaking the area where the disease had done such brutal work. With the quarantine in effect, the steady stream of ships plying the river had vanished, the river patrol keeping ships from the port. Even so, two men stood upon the wooden pier in the early hours of dawn. The taller of the pair wore the heavy black robes of a priest of Moor. Beside him stood a thin figure garbed in grey, his lank black hair hanging in his eyes, his features displaying a trace of foreign blood. In his hands, the Tylean held a glass vessel filled with black ash. Carandini watched the sun rise into the sky, the shadows of night retreating before it. He smiled as the warm rays bathed his face. A necromancer was not a kind to cultivate an intimate relationship with the sun, their loathsome activities best conducted under the shroud of night. But today, today, he could think of no more glorious a sight. His fingers stroked the surface of the bottle. It won't be long now. I will not do this thing, the priest moaned. It is an affront to more. I will not do it. Carandini took a step towards the man, shaking his head sadly. I worry that you are looking at this the wrong way, father. While it may be true that my chosen vocation is at odds with the puerile superstitions of your morbid little cult, that doesn't mean we can't be friends. Why, I am doing you a great boon. I am giving you the opportunity to do a favor for your god, to be of noble service to him. You are being given the chance to write an affront to the divinity of your god, to reclaim something stolen from his domain. You are a monster, the priest spat, horrified by Carandini's words. You are a profaner of moor, a violator of graves, a corpse-stealing monster. The necromancer tapped a forefinger against the bottle he held. Hardly as monstrous as what is in this bottle, father. He thrust it towards the priest, laughing as the robed man shrank back from the vessel. See, even reduced to ash and dust, the dread Sibekai still has the power to frighten you. How can you say what I ask of you is some crime against your god? Why, I am only doing what the witch hunters would have done had I left the vampire cinders in their possession. Then why steal it at all? Why this profane farce? The necromancer's face lost its air of humor and condescension. Because I owe this thing a debt. I have to see for myself that it has been destroyed, that its remains have been removed from any possibility of resurrection. I have to make sure that none of its filthy kind will learn of Sibekai's death and seek to restore their fellow fiend. Carandini smiled once more as he looked back to the rising sun. The long game of trick and trap he had played with the Necrarch was over, and it was Carandini, not Sibekai, who had emerged as the victor. The vampire had almost triumphed, leaving the necromancer in the cellars underneath the castle, compelled to stay behind, while the Necrarch tried to claim Das Buch Dune Holden. The arrival of the Skaven had nearly been the death of him, the filthy magics of the horned Skaven sending an army of ravenous rats to consume the necromancer. It had taken every trace of his willpower and skill to conceal himself from the rats, to weave such a cloak of black magic around himself that even their keen senses couldn't find him. The effort of focusing and maintaining such power had nearly killed him. Even now, the memory caused his heart to thunder in his breast. But the spell had held and Carandini did not die. He had sensed the destruction of Sibekai when the enchantment the vampire had placed upon him was broken. Before Carandini could rush into the castle above to look for the grimoire, however, he had seen the Skaven return, fleeing back into their burrows. Once again he had locked eyes with the horned sorcerer, 
By this time, the ratman held thus Bukhti and Holden in its foul paws. Had the creature been alone, Carandini might have dared to confront it, despite its tremendous power. The ratman was not alone, though. Nearly a score of its fellows still hurried after it. The necromancer had remained hidden, his sense of self-preservation overcoming the lust for the book. Now he knew who had it. He would be able to find it again, and when he did, it would be under circumstances that favored him, not the Skaven. Are we ready, father? Carandini asked. The cleric didn't speak, merely bowed his head in submission. He joined the necromancer on the edge of the dock, a silver talisman clutched in his hands, arcane words whispering past his lips. Carandini tapped the glass bottle once more and held it over the river, popping the cork from its neck. As the priest continued to invoke the rite of exorcism, Carandini turned the bottle over, scattering the vampire's ashes into the swift-moving Stir River. Repast and pace, Carandini echoed the priest, as he watched the last dregs of ash tumble from the bottle. He hoped that whatever more deposited the souls of vanquished vampires, it was unpleasant. Sir, I think I see light ahead. The words were spoken by a young, blond-haired soldier from the Ministry of Justice. He was one of only three survivors Fulman and Erhart had encountered in the tunnels. Do you think there could be more survivors? Erhart asked the witch hunter. Possibly, or it may be that our ratty friends try to draw us into a trap again. Fulman replied, his voice heavy with fatigue. Either way, we can't afford to avoid it. If it is some of our comrades, we cannot abandon them. If it is a trap, it shows more intelligence and organization than these running battles we've been fighting. Something will be in charge, one of their noxious leaders. If we can capture it alive, we may be able to extract information from it, find a way out of here, or maybe find the creature we came to kill. One by one, Fulman's group extinguished their torches, crawling through the darkness as they followed the witch hunter towards the light. Soon they were close enough to see shadows moving in the tunnel ahead, and hear voices whispering in the darkness. I still say we are heading the wrong way, a man's voice snarled. Do as you like, came the growled reply. But I'm sticking to this tunnel. The way the mangy curse had been thick along it, it has to lead somewhere. The second voice was terribly familiar to the witch hunter. He was pleased to find that his henchman Streng had also been lucky enough to escape the Skaven trap. You've been saying that for the last half an hour, snapped another of the soldiers, busily tying a bandage around his arm. And he is in no doubt correct. The men all spun around, blades at the ready as Fulman spoke, eyes narrowed as they peered into the dark. The witch hunter strode boldly into the ring of light, his fatigue forgotten at the joy of finding more of his men alive. To Streng and the men around him, the witch hunter's sudden emergence from the gloom was almost supernatural, some divine sending of Holy Sigmar himself. The effect lessened somewhat when Erhart and the free Ministry of Justice troopers followed him. The miracle was somewhat cheapened for being shared. We thought you were dead, Streng observed, when he managed to recover from the shock. The mercenary scratched a filthy hand through his scraggly beard. I should have known it would take more than a few tons of earth falling upon you to finish you, Matthias. Fulman clapped a hand on Streng's shoulder causing a puff of dust to rise from his leather hauberk. I am not so surprised to see you, either. You've crawled your way out of more miserable holes than this in the aftermath of one of your drunken revels. The stocky mercenary smiled at the remark. His employer had never approved of the impiety of his ways. Now that you've decided to put in an appearance, I'll let you lead this rabble, Strang said, gesturing at the men around him. You fought the Skaven in the past. Maybe they'll believe you when you say that the best chance we've got of getting back is to go where the rats are thickest. Fulman stared at his henchman, noting the curious look in Strang's eyes. He wasn't sure exactly what the warrior was playing at, but he would follow his lead, for the time at least. My assistant is indeed correct, the witch hunter said in a quiet, controlled voice. 
If there have been more skaven in these passages, then they are most likely trying to keep us from reaching a path to the surface and escaping this pit. Stick to this passage, and before long we'll be feeling the sun driving the dampness of these burrows out of our bones. The encouraging words had their effect. Fulman saw many of the soldiers smile grimly at the prospect of regaining the surface. Strang had driven them as far as he could with nothing more than simple hatred. Fulman offered them something that could take them further, and that was hope. He felt remorse that his hopeful words were untrue, but knew that only by keeping the men moving would they stand any chance. Erhard seemed to be the only one who detected the hollowness of Fulman's words. He said nothing, however, simply resting his enormous sword against his shoulder and taking a torch from one of the soldiers. Holding the brand aloft, the giant knight marched deeper into the passage. The survivors lost little time in following after the imposing Erhardt. Strang and Fulman lingered behind to form a rear guard. Mind explaining what is going on? Fulman asked, his voice low so that only the henchman could hear the words. You know as well as I that whatever organized defense these monsters had collapsed as surely as the tunnel back there. They aren't trying to keep us from some path back to the city. These are frightened, disorganized packs of animals, falling back to their innermost lair, instinctively protecting the most vital areas of the warren, the breeding pits and the burrows of the ruling elite. I'm not leading these men towards the surface. I'm leading them deeper into the warren. Why? A harsh intensity was on Strang's face when he turned to answer the witch hunter. We found a room back there, the mercenary said. A big cave with a lot of strange equipment in it, the sort of stuff an alchemist might have, or a physician. We found a lot of bodies too, and not all of them were rats. Most of them man and rat alike had masks like the plague doctor was using. Vice then, Fulman hissed, spitting the name off his tongue as if it was poison. Strang nodded grimly. He was here, Matthias, working with the Skaven. Looked like he might have fallen out with his host, though, but if he did, his body wasn't among the dead. Fulman looked away, his eyes fixed upon the shadows of the passage. A hundred bitter memories swarmed inside his skull, snarling their anger in his mind. Of all the heretic scum he'd hunted over the years, he could think of only one worse than the renegade doctor. You think he might still be here? Thulman asked through clenched teeth. If he isn't, whatever rat is the boss of this nest might know where he's gone, Strang answered. That's why I wanted to press deeper into the maze, try to get my hands on one of their leaders. The witch hunter nodded his head. He knew that Strang did much of what he did for money. No higher purpose motivated him, but catching Freiherr Weiss had become as much of an obsession to the callous mercenary as it was to himself. Our first priority must remain finding the horned skaven with the book, Fulman cautioned. The black knowledge contained in the Das Buch Dion Holden had been enough to transform the ruler of Wurtbad into a living avatar of the Unclean One. Who could say what even greater horrors the toe might unleash upon the world if it was allowed to stay in such evil hands? As much as he hated vice, he was forced to recognize that the book was the greater threat. I'll remember that, Strang replied, favoring Fulman with a murderous grin. But if I will have a chance at vice, all the black secrets in Sylvania won't keep me from taking it. Carandini watched with eager anticipation as the sun began to sink from the sky, casting long shadows into the dilapidated fishmonger's shop. There had been a great deal to make ready before the onset of night, yet even so Carandini had spent the last few hours in impatient expectancy. The ritual he was preparing was an ancient one, from a time when the spires of ghoul-haunted Lamia still stood proud and tall beside the crystal sea. It had been in his possession for a long time, but he never had the opportunity to test its efficiency. Thanks to the witch hunters, however, that opportunity had presented itself at last. Carandini retreated back into the building, treading cautiously so as not to disturb the chalk sigils he had drawn across the floor. 
he could feel the mystical energy being pulled into the ancient symbols, the sorcerer's power growing even as the sun's light became more feeble. Soon, the light of the thirteen candles he placed around the room would be the only thing contesting the darkness. The flames that rose from them glowed with a haunting blue light. They were true corpse candles, necromantic talismans crafted from the fat of murdered men. Carandini was careful to avoid staring at the flames directly. The black arts were dangerous to evoke, even to necromancers. The flame of the corpse candle formed a bridge between the domains of life and death. The incautious will find themselves mesmerized by the haunting light, helpless to prevent their souls from being drawn into the flame, or to prevent something from the other side slipping through and investing itself in their flesh. The necromancer fixed his attention instead upon the object which was the focus of the ritual. Lying at the center of the room, at the very nexus of the symbols and designs drawn on the floor, was a large black wooden box, the coffin lately inhabited by the necrarch Sibekai. Carandini could almost see the dark energies gathering around the casket, permeating the wooden surface and the iron fittings, suffusing the thing lying inside. The ritual required one more component, human blood. Carandini snapped his fingers, exerting his will. There was a gap between the circles and the pentagrams on the floor, a narrow walkway leading from the outer ring of the chamber towards the casket lying at the center. The necromancer exerted his will, and two shuffling, tattered shapes began to approach the coffin. Between them, the two zombies bore the struggling, whimpering figure of the priest of Moor. The captive's cries were little more than inarticulate gargles, the necromancer having removed the man's tongue. Gods sometimes answered the prayers of their priests, and Carandini was not of a mind to take any chances. The zombies carried their charge to the casket, forcing the man to bend at the waist and lean over the open coffin. The priest's inarticulate screaming rose in pitch as he saw what lay inside, and he suddenly understood the necromancer's purpose and his own role. The cadaverous claw of a zombie ripped into the priest's throat, tearing through the flesh and slashing the windpipe. The dying man struggled in the remorseless grip of the zombies as a cataract of blood exploded out of his neck, spraying a wash of gore into the casket. Carandini exerted his will once more and his undead servants withdrew further, bearing the remnants of the priest with them. The necromancer paid them no further notice, his attention riveted to the casket. Would it work? He wondered. The necromancer dismissed his doubts. The ritual would succeed. It would succeed because he willed it so. He would not be denied. His enemies would not keep him away from his destiny. Thus Buchdion Holden would be his. He would make its secrets his own, and the thing inside the coffin would help him take it from those that stood in his way. From his vantage point across the street, Carandini had seen Fulman lead his witch hunters back to the chapter house. He had seen them bearing the ashes of the treacherous former partner Sibekai and the more intact corpse of the vampire's minion, the vengeful creature Carandini had briefly encountered in the cellars of the castle. The ashes of his ally had already been attended to. Now he intended to put the remains of Sibekai's errant thrall to use. Carandini held his breath as he sensed a change in the air of the room. The light of the corpse candles dimmed, the atmosphere became colder. A black mist gathered around the casket and was sucked down inside the coffin. And then the moment passed, warmth beginning to creep back into the room and the candles returned to their former brilliance. A pale hand rose from within the coffin, closing around the edge of the box. Carandini watched in fascinated triumph as a body slowly rose from the casket, a pallid shape that exuded an aura of strength and power despite its sickly hue. The creature turned a once handsome face in the direction of the necromancer, the patrician features drawn and haggard, eyes at once empty and hungry. Slowly, awkwardly, the thing pulled itself from the coffin, struggling to get out. The necromancer watched its efforts with pride reveling in his own accomplishment. After a moment, the undead thing stood upon its own feet. It glared at Carandini, and the necromancer could see a spark of awareness behind the vampire's hunger. He felt no fear, however. 
the words he had placed on the floor, would contain the vampire until he was ready to release it. Gregor Klausner, I believe, Carandini laughed, the sound filled with all the mockery and scorn of old night and the dark gods. <laughs>